sort of get a hand raised. How many of you are EdTech entrepreneurs? How many of you are investors in EdTech? Good. How many of you are in the classroom teaching K-12 higher ed, ed that you're a practitioner? How many of you are coming to the business plan competition on May 10th and 11th? Good. <laughs> and if you're not and want to come, let me know because we're just about full. We, we're going to close tomorrow. We're going to close registration. We're oversubscribed. So, and then the last question I want to ask, how many of you applied to the business plan competition? Good. Great. So, a nice diverse group and as um, Alani said I when I came to Philadelphia I was keeping a spreadsheet of the ed tech companies in the city and there was maybe 10 of that if I stretched my imagination and now I, I can't keep track of them anymore there's a growing number of ed tech uh, many of them have been extremely successful I'm sure you all watched Scully um, on Shark Tank if you have it it's the most viewed YouTube session of uh, Shark Tank he was one of our winners in um, at our business plan competition. Uh, Trobo, which is a talking bear that teaches STEM skills to early childhood, also just was on, um, was just on the Shark Tank also. So we're beginning to see a lot of people come out of Philadelphia, and we just did a count um, today. <coughs> 18 of the companies that have either come through our business plan competition or been in Etsy have been on the 30 under 30 list for Forbes. So we are beginning to create a network around here. So let's kind of talk about whether ed innovation, ed tech is really innovative, or and can we disrupt a le a, an a, a space, education, that's not particularly innovative. So, um, so I want to start out by something that I really want to share with you all that I really like. The world's changing faster than ever before, and so is your job. You're now surrounded by more data, more complexity, and more so-called experts than ever before. But is the world really any different? Because while the questions may keep changing, you still want the same answers. The most accurate, compelling, and cost-effective ways of getting your audience to respond to your messages. Only now, we can give you even better answers. Ones that let you get to know hundreds, thousands, millions of people in ways you never even thought possible. How? By helping you to embrace data like never before. Coupling it with technology totally new to our industry and using both in more insightful, imaginative and creative ways. Giving you the sort of one-to-one -one brand relationships that once you could only have dreamed of. Allowing things to carry on just as they did before, only better. Much, much better. I'm very interested in how this all works together. And my latest interest is in curriculum for kids that are coming in from underserved neighborhoods and what we're not giving, we're not looking at the curriculum and the contextual curriculum. And we realize that many of these kids that come into the classroom at from these neighborhoods are coming with a lot of knowledge, but we set them in the classroom and we ignore the fact that many of them are using food stamps, taking care of their children, cooking. I mean, there's they already have a whole set of skills that we tell them are not useful. So we need to look at a much deeper level at what we're thinking about. So there's a lot of things going on in education today that's causing an opportunity for ed tech innovators. One, we're all interested in accountability. We give, we, we, struggling with assessment, we're tr struggling with how do we match skills to jobs. We also are seeing this massive change from physical in the classroom to digital in the text, in between the textbooks, between content curriculum. We're also seeing a lot of cost pressure. Unfortunately, the internet set up this expectation that everything's free, but it's not free. But in schools, they're saying, well, let's use open source or let's use the internet because it's free. Well, it's free like free beer. <laughs> <laughs> and it's and we're spent spending a lot of time looking at personalized learning. What does that mean today? What is adaptive learning? Or is adaptive really adaptive? And there's lots of companies, whole list of companies that are saying they're doing adaptive learning. And we're also looking at globalization. Um, in, later on in the slideshow, I'll talk about what's going on globally in ed tech because it's a growing market around the world. So part of the problem we have is we're trying to innovate in an old knowledge space. That's a linear knowledge space. All of us, not all of us, because some of you that are young are probably not learning this way, but those of us that are older, we learned in a linear knowledge space. We start on page one, we get 
Page 360, we read the book, we take a test, and we learned that information. But all the learners today are working in this new random knowledge space. We're multitasking, we're doing just-in-time learning, we're watching the debates. I read an article today that said those people that are using social media at the same time they're watching the debates learn more than those of us that just watch the debates because we're la laughing at how stupid the candidates are. But anyway, there is this whole mo random knowledge space going on. So we're multitasking. Um, I remember watching middle school students and I sat in the room. They were on their computer, they were chatting on their phone, and they were searching the internet to find the information to help each other. So there's a lot of peer-to-peer -peer learning going on. So this is changing the environment in which we're working. I, I really like this. Um, this is, says, educators still persist with this myth. I'll be happy to give you innovative thinking. What are the guidelines? <laughs> so in education in particular, we are bound by this governance, this box that we're in. And so when we choose to innovate, we want to think outside of the box we are afraid to because there's all these guidelines that we have to adhere to. The best teachers I know go in their classroom, close the door, and do what they want. And the principal thinks miraculously they have the best students in the school, and they have no idea that they've come, they're not doing what the, the curriculum says to do. They're making it better. And I also saw this one today. It, some say innovation's hard work, not in the least because it moves, involves changing hearts and minds of many others from colleagues to consumers, and it takes practice, persistence, and patience. And this says, no thanks, we're too busy. <laughs> so in some sense, that's what happens in schools. When you go in schools and you want to int introduce project-based learning, and they say, oh, we can't do that because we're too busy teaching for the test, and we don't, we, we're afraid if we use project-based learning, we won't get the results we want, but, and therefore we'll have to double teach, rather than seeing it as a better way to teach, or they'll get better results. So we are working in a new innovation ecosystem. This ecosystem consists of an a uniquely different group of people and constituencies than we've worked in before. We are working with researchers. First time in a long time I see researchers in the mix for ed entrepreneurs. They come to my office and they want to know what the research is behind what they're doing, or if they don't want to know, I tell them they should know. <laughs> so um, research is really important because somebody comes in and says I'm going to build a new product in red and all the research says it's in blue I'm not suggesting you don't build it in red uber would have never existed if they didn't build it in red but they need to understand what the blue is so they can know what it's doing right or wrong and they can disrupt it so that you do need to understand the academic research behind it and education's academic research is a real mess It's kind of hard to get through because we don't do a very good job of taking what we found out in the research and taking it to practice. So that's what entrepreneurs should be able to help the researcher do. So they're part of the ecosystem. The other part of the ecosystem is the investors, and the government funding and the foundations. We are now seeing that investors are not just waiting for a company to show up their door and say, I want to raise a half a million dollars, invest in me. The investors are now saying, I really need to understand the the company, I need to understand the environment, I need to understand what's happening. So investors are now asking for help and they're hiring people, like the people that are attending our Masters in Entrepreneurship class, they're hiring education advisors. They're using them in their due diligence because they now need to understand the pedagogy and they need to understand the governance of what's going on. So now investors, which used to be over here, and entrepreneurs, which used to be over here in education, are now finding that they need to talk to each other much sooner than when I'm coming in to ask you for a half a million dollars. So we, of course, have the entrepreneurs. And the problem with entrepreneurs is that they never look at the research. They often don't know the competition very well. And they don't understand the investment community. So they learn when somebody tells, when they decide they're going to run out of money and they're going to have to close up shop, they decide, oh, I better go ask somebody for money. Of course, the first people you ask are your friends and family and fools. So <laughs> they invest because they like you or because they would like to do something that they think is going to have a social impact. You're in a really good time in some ways for raising money because there's a lot of social impact investing going on. And they're investing in three areas. They're investing in health, they're investing in education, and they're investing in green technologies and, and green and conservation and energy kind of things. And of course, 
The main people that are often left out of this are the teachers, students, and the practitioners out there. We all have to find somebody to pilot our projects. And the ability to pilot a new idea in a school is very, very difficult because that poor principal or that poor teacher gets 30 of you showing up saying, I've got the best thing since sliced bread, and just let me have one teacher in one class to pilot it in. Well, that, you just can't do it that way. So I am a big believer that that's an area for disruption. And, and I really would like to start a company with somebody who wants to out there. Um, I really think we need to create a <laughs> disruptive way to pilot new ideas at schools. And my idea is that we're going to go in and we're going to create a virtual tool, a virtual pilot, so I don't have to go through the school or the principal. I'm going to get people to sign up online because there's great uses of teachers out there. And I'm going to provide them a platform for testing new products. And teachers will randomly be able to sign up. And you won't have to go through IRBs and you won't have to go through all the permission it takes to get in the classroom. Because if we're testing digital projects, we might as well test them in a virtual environment. So I see it as a three-phase product. But in the meantime, we need to get them involved earlier. <coughs> and teachers are already testing these projects out there. How many of you open up your iPhone, and how many of you have at least 30 apps that you downloaded that you were going to see how it worked? And you may have continued to use it. You may not have. And you probably wished you could have given some feedback to the developer that says, you know what, I'd use this if you did x, y, or z. Or I like this, and I'm going to refer it to somebody else. Or it becomes your app of stability. You use it all the time. And nobody knows that in the education classroom of teachers that are using apps all the time. How many of you read the Ed Surge newsletters? If you don't, you should sign up, edsurge.com. And she, they put out three newsletters now, two originally and now three. They put out one specifically for educators in the classroom. And it tells you every week exactly what new apps and new programs are out there. And I often go on and find things that I would have never found before. And they now have one for higher ed also. So if we get all of these people talking to each other, we're going to be able to create a much more robust and effective innovation ecosystem. So who's doing this, and how do we get these people connected? So um, before we sort of talk about what it is, who is doing it, let's talk about some of the myths about these ecosystems out there. The first myth is that without venture capital financing, an ecosystem cannot flourish. Well, that's probably not true, because what's happening is people like here at Meetups are already beginning to create these ecosystems, and the investors who normally wouldn't have showed up at a Meetup is now realizing that's where they're going to find the most exciting and new things to be at. And when I invest in things, I often start looking at them very, very early. And I have followed in companies for two or three years, and then I'll show up and say, I'm ready to invest. And, but I normally did that stealth, and now I do it pretty actively. I actually follow many companies, meet with them, say, can I come in and make some suggestions? Can I introduce you to somebody? So when I come to the table, I can bring not only my money, but I can bring a group of people that are part of this ecosystem. So. Um, most entrepreneurs have not relied on venture capital, so most of you think, oh, the only companies that grew raised a lot of money. That's not the case. Only of the 500 f firms in that, only of 5,000 firms in the high growth companies today, only 500 of those have taken venture capital. That means there's 4,500 firms out there that grew other ways. Um, myth, incubators and accelerators spur entrepreneurial growth. Well, there are some data that says businesses affiliated with incubators do not perform better than those businesses not affiliated with incubators. I'm a big believer in this. Every time we run our incubator, I say to myself, I've got to rework it. We've got to relook at what we're doing. So every year so far, we've run three cohorts, very successful. We have a better hit rate than a venture capital of our incubator. Over 35% of our companies have gone on to raise money. And VCs only getting one out of 10 on the average if they're lucky. So we need to reconceive them. We need to be part of this ecosystem. And so now we're bringing to our incubator the investors from the beginning. They're part of the incubator. We're bringing to the table the researchers that early on to look at what we're doing. And we're bringing to the table teachers and practitioners from day one and pilots. Myth, entrepreneurs need university research funding. Well, the truth of the matter, matter is 
I find when I was running a big investment fund, we ran, Core Learning was a $50 million fund, we only invested in companies that came out of research universities. Now why would I do that? Well, why should I pay any money as an investor to do the R&D when the university companies got the R&D done by the government? So I was investing in companies that had already had large grants or SBIR money to, so I didn't have to pay a lot of my investment dollars to develop the product. I used my investment dollars to grow the product and to create the company. So how do you create entrepreneurial success? Um, and we've already sort of talked about this, but we need to begin to get bring together all of these parts. And if you're really interested in this research, the Kauffman Foundation does an extensive amount of research. If you go to their website, you can find all of their reports on entrepreneurship and growing early stage companies and funding them. But as I already said, we are now looking at a combination of things that require this. We need accelerators and, and innovators. We need supportive culture. We need investment capital. We need institutions of higher education that are doing the research. We need a talented and skilled workforce. One of the reasons Philadelphia was slow to grow in ed tech co uh, community was one, people would say, well, there's no community here. I can't find good tech people, or I can't find team members, or there's not a lot of investors. And that's changed in Philadelphia, but Philadelphia is still not a very robust VC early stage investment community. They are not high risk, and that's a high risk area. But that's changing too. Some of the more, you know, some of the larger ones here, LLR, which is a large private equity group, has actually bought and invested in a company out of the University of Virginia and merged it with another company that they invested in. So it's changing. We need to understand what the regulatory policy is. So as you look at this, you will not necessarily have all of these pieces in your recipe, but you should be aware of all of these pieces. And I'll be glad to share this slideshow with any closer. Um, so the EdTech market is growing very fast. In 2017, it's projected to be a $65.6 .6 billion market. That's revenue and sales. Um, the global learning market is projected to be $166 billion. And right now, the current marketplace Depends on who you ask. So the 687 million and the 535 million and the 133 million. It, it, about 1.5 billion dollars has been invested in EdTech. That's only 5% of the current 1.3 trillion dollar education market. So investors like big opportunities. You can't disrupt something unless it's a big opportunity. And so you need, this market is primed to be an opportunity. Um, unfortunately, in education, we need to be investing, and we're investing in the wrong places. Everybody's, investors, myself included, is a lemming. We want to invest in the things that everybody else is investing in because why should we take the risk all by ourselves? But the truth of the matter, the most innovative ideas in education are occurring here. And they're not getting the money. They're, they should be getting the money. Unfortunately, what's up, up now where the people are getting the money is on this end of the scale. So how do we change or flip the model? How do we get enough money into the ecosystem to get early stage companies to start? And they don't need a lot of money. They need a little bit of money. And I call this transition or gap funding money. How do we take an idea and transition them or give them the funding to get to the higher end of the investment cycle? So there's a lot of things that are going on. The bigger problem is, how do we find the most innovative ideas that we think will be successful? A venture capitalist who I have a lot of respect for in the education field is a guy by the name of Matt Greenfield. And he runs Rethink Education. They've done a lot of big investments, but they've always looked at them very early. Matt Greenfield was the first money into wireless generation, which went on to be bought. The end of the story is not as good as the middle of the story, but went on to be bought for $450 million by Amplify, which was Murdoch's company. It obviously crashed and burned for completely separate issues, but at the time, it was, Matt Greenfield was the first dollars in to um, wireless generation. He also was the first dollars into N-grade, he was the first dollars into several other early stage innovations. So he says that, the problem, the reason we are seeing so many failures in ed tech 
is that investors are trying to follow the what's most exciting to invest in. So he says he only invests in companies that are solving a really big problem in education. So make sure as you look at what you're doing, make sure it's solving a very big problem and that it has a very big market that can it address. Um, because many entrepreneurs come in and they tell me that they're gonna go after this market and it looks like the market's big until they drill down and find out that the market they're going after is very, very, very small. So you have to be clear that the market's big and that you're solving a problem that will help this big market. And he only invests in that. Of course, he probably has some intellectual ability to pick the right horses. But if he looks at it from that lens, he will get there. And, and Matt's very funny because he's a Yale PhD in English. And he jokes and says he's the only New Yorker published poet in, uh, that's a VC. <laughs> So I just, I'll again share this with you, but this is going to show you who the top investors are in education. So New Schools Venture Fund, which is now morphed into REACH, is, has invested in all of these companies across here. Um, 500 Startups is also invested, surprisingly, because most people think of 500 Startups as being a really high-tech investor, not an education investor. But they've invested in a larger, a large number of um, education companies also. Um, Learn Capital has just put $150 billion to invest in global early childhood uh, companies with the IFC. So right now, if you're doing anything in early childhood education, you're probably a good bet to raise money. Um, the Kapoor Capitals, anybody know who Mitch Kapoor is? Mitch Kapoor is the one that created Lotus 1, 2, 3. He created VisiCalc and it became Lotus 1, 2, 3. He sold it, obviously, to IBM and he did very well, and since then he's been on a mission to invest in education, and he does a lot of really interesting stuff. He's a really good investor also. You know, you're gonna to begin to see some interesting lemming effects. Remember the first one, new schools that invested in NGRADE, Rethink in Education, NGRADE just sold for about $125 million to McGraw-Hill. So, um, Tal is a um, Indian, uh, I mean, a Chinese one, and they've done some interesting investments. Um, NEA, it's interesting, NEA is one of the largest and you know prolific investors across all fields, but even they have done some very interesting education investors. How many people know EverFi? EverFi's raised a lot of money. They are a very interesting business model of looking at what they call orphan curriculum in higher ed, and they go out and partner with foundations to fund the school district or the university to buy it, and then they turn around and buy it from the EverFi. So they help basically leverage the nonprofit community to be into a for-profit. Um, social Capital does a lot. GSV, um, uh, last week was GSV's big conference. They had 3,500 people show up. It was like speed dating at its worst, mm -hmm. but um, <laughs> it's always a good place to network. <laughs> and uh, Declaro is one of their big investors. Curious is also one of their big investors. Coursera is a big invest investment of theirs. Excel Partners, which again is one of the big traditional private equity groups and venture capitalists have invested. So just so I can give you a summary, New Schools Venture Fund is one of the top. It takes first place with 30 unique EdTech portfolio companies. Jennifer Carolyn, who runs the um, REACH Fund now, she is came to Philadelphia last week, really out of her venue. She showed up in Philadelphia because there's a company out here that went through Imagine K-12, which was, a, was on the West Coast incubator, and they want to be in Philadelphia, and she's going to invest in them. So she's putting together their first investment money, a company called KickUp, Ben Franklin Technology Partners put some of the early money into that. So we are beginning to see the West Coast company, West Coast investors coming to us. So um, they put in 30. Their biggest one last year was Parchment. Parchment is, uh, was started by the same guy that started Blackboard, and they put $23 million in that. Notice Wright Lab shows up on two of these. Uh, I don't think it's on the screen, but Wright Lab was here, and I, and I think Learn Capital put some money. Yes, yeah, Learn Capital put $2 million into the Wright Lab also. Um, 500 Startups, their biggest one was a Series A to Culture Alley, and Learn Capital, as I told you, is doing a lot of interesting stuff. They did Coursera. 
Now this is one I don't get, but Old School got $100 million. How many of you know who Old School is? They just had an article in the New Yorker. They are, this school started by Google, ex-wealthy Google people, and they basically are a project-based, technology-based school where kids kind of do what they want. Khan, Khan also has started a school similar. They raised $100 million, and right here in Philadelphia, Josh Koppelman from First Round Capital put money in. He's never put money in something like that. So we're beginning to see ed tech play pretty hard. Um, so, but, there's always a but, the investment in the ed tech is slowing, it's getting worse. Uh, the term sheets I saw in the last two months are about 25% below what they would have been about six months ago. And investors are being more cautious. What's happened is because the anytime you have a, a, a very noisy and robust community, everybody wants to play. So everybody could get money. And San Francisco could walk down the street and raise $100,000 by just saying you were an ed tech company. Um, but all of a sudden, they realize that there's too much money floating around. There's too many companies out there. And so they are looking for the best companies. And they're valuing them lower because they've learned how long it takes to get an exit or to get a growth on an ed tech company. So as you can see, right now for 2016, 2015 was a big year and they're only estimating 1.3 versus 3.117 last year. So be careful if any of you are looking to raise money, be humble, realize that you're gonna take money at a lower valuation and you're also going to understand that you'll get, if you want more money, you're gonna give up more of your company. So remember, you're worth zero to begin with, Giving up 5% more if you can get the money to grow is not, is not worth arguing over. Yeah. But also, isn't that downturn a reflection? I spent half my time in Silicon Valley now. Right, good for you. <laughs> isn't that also a reflection that there just hasn't been a really disruptive technology mm -hmm. that scaled with EdTech and the returns have been pretty Yeah, visible. that's what I said, exactly. So They're it's not so much that there's so much money in there that they haven't been successful as well, a Well, a lot of people put a lot of money, right. is what I mean, and they've not been successful, so right. that's causing them the, to even back the, off. Even the big funds haven't been successful. No, no been nobody. Returns. I mean, if you look at it, which I think I have a slide in here, if you look at where the money's gone and who's actually returned any investment, it's been very, very few. And they've been at very, very large scale. So when you get that big number, the $1.6 billion has gone into ed, ed tech you have to understand that 1.2 billion of it was a purchase lynda.com and you know so i mean yes. by by uh, linkedin and that renaissance learning raised 1.2 billion dollars with google involved in it so you are looking at a sort of skewed picture of what's really gone into the smaller just people trying to disrupt this so you're absolutely right um, so however there are accelerators and they're playing a key role at the seed stage Silicon Valley had the first education tech uh, incubator. It was called Imagine K-12. Any of you know Imagine K-12? Did you do? You didn't do it, did no, you? Didn't do it. Yeah. Um, Imagine K-12 was around longer. That they were slightly ahead of us. I think they ran four cohorts or five, and, and we just finished our third one at Etsy. They, by the way, have just combined with Y Combinator. The reason they did that is they raised a $13 million fund to put in their companies, of which they probably ran 65 or 70 companies through, and they have no exits and no returns, so they've decided that th it's silly to raise another fund unless they can show, they will not raise another fund, unless they could show that they were getting some return. So they merged with Y Combinator, which has a bigger footprint, a bigger opportunity to get it. And they were originally one of the investors in Imagine K-12. Imagine K-12 spun out of Y Combinator, raised an independent fund, and now just went back in. Um, Learn Launch is Boston connected with Harvard. Learn Launch is also reinventing themselves. They haven't had a hit. You know, they've got a lot of good companies that have raised additional rounds, but they haven't had a big hit. Edge is in New York. It was originally the Kaplan um, Tech Stars combination, and they um, ran it for two, two cohorts and decided that they weren't Tech Kaplan wasn't going to support it anymore. They weren't getting returns they wanted, so they ran, went after independent funding. They just finished their first cohort. Um, Kaufman runs in Kansas City an impact engine. 
And in Washington, which is more than Washington, D.C., but 1776 started in Washington, they run a quasi-incubator program, but they are investing in tech companies. And of course, we run Etsy here in Philadelphia. Globally, there are lots of these companies showing up. In Israel, you have two incubators, two Advantage and Mindset. In the UK, you have Emerge. In Canada, you have Mars. Australia, you have Edspark. In Chile, you have Chile Startup. They have a similar one in Brazil. Um, I've seen some interesting companies come out of the Chile, company, Chile Startup. Any of you are willing to move to Chile, they give you $40,000 and free space and support and go live in Chile and build your ed tech company. Um, so what's going to happen here? What are we going to do? What do I think? And of course, since this is worth, you're paying me zero, take this as the value there. So <laughs> either, um, take this for, for interesting information or actually think it's helpful. Um, so I think there's a few areas where we're going to see innovation happening and where I think there's going to be funding. The first one is that I see visualization of data and big data. We, we spent the last five years in education saying we need to do decision, data-driven de decision-making in schools. Everybody should be looking at the data to decide what they do with kids in schools. The truth of the matter is there's a lot of data out there and the, the teachers have no idea how to look at it and what it means. So I'm looking at new companies that are helping to visualize this data in new ways. I think the, the group that comes up with a way that I can pick up my cell phone or my iPhone and somebody can give me a dashboard on that student that I can easily understand and can recommend to me what I should be doing for that student that didn't get this standard for this common core objective, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be an opportunity to invest in a company that's potentially going to be a big hit. I think the other thing I see is we're set, seeing a lot of money going into OER models, but we haven't figured out a model to make that sustainable. So I think we're going to be looking for how can I take this whole growth of the open source community, like a Wikipedia, like MOOCs, and, and all of the things that are happening in open source and shared and free, there's got to be a business model to make them sustainable. And the business models that somebody can figure out are going to be areas that are going to see a lot of growth. Um, there's a couple of companies that are kind of beginning to see that. Um, and I think even Udemy, who was in the MOOC side, realized that they weren't going to make any money in the model that they had before. I think we're going to see a lot of aggregation of content. The publishing industry has, is just ripe for disruption. And the problem is everybody needed to buy proprietary content. But the teachers didn't want to use one book anymore. They don't want to use one curriculum. They want to be able to add and supplement that curriculum, and they want it to come from things they pay for, as well as things that they can find free on the internet. So good systems for aggregating content that are expert driven and make the pedagogy very easy to aggregate the content are going to be winners. They big problem in addition to this problem with free and not free and proprietary is one side that has to be solved. The other side has to be solved in what's the glue or the scaffolding that I need to go and use free content combined with proprietary content because I can't just show the kid this video and then follow it up with a worksheet that I found somewhere else. The teacher has to know what the pedagogy is which is what textbook did for the teacher. It said if you went through this sequence, 